This is a HeadGum Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you in part by My Fluffy Puffs. Instead of a conditioner that crushes your curls, try My Fluffy Puffs, giving you curls that stay stronger, softer, and easier to style. That's MyFluffyPuffs.com. Also brought to you in part by Texas Triffid Ranch. Are you looking for a plant store that's unique, different, and that sells carnivorous plants? Well, guess what? We found the place just for you. It's called Texas Triffid Ranch. This is not your ordinary plant store. Check out one of the most interesting plant stores deep in the heart of Texas. Texas Triffid Ranch specializes in carnivorous, prehistoric, and exotic plants. So go to their website, that's txtrffidranch.com, odd plants and oddities for odd people. We've We've all been been to cons cons with with diversity diversity panels. panels. Now, with your help, we will be able to go to a diverse con with inclusive panels and so much more. Universal Fan Con will be a con for the fans, by the fans, with With a a focus focus on on diversity diversity and inclusion. inclusion. We're reaching out to fans from all levels of fandom, from the shining Halo ring array to the twisted mind of Jigsaw. From the hallowed halls of Hogwarts to the inseparable Ehrlich brothers. This This con con will have have something for everyone. everyone. We're calling on our fellow fans, disabled fans, LGBTQ fans, Native American, Asian American, African American, Latino American, and all the other groups that coexist within this vast universe of fandom. We We ask ask you you to go to to www.universalfancon.com. Again, that's www.universalfancon.com. And support the con we've all been waiting for. Thank Thank you. you. Thanks for tuning in to this BGM Podcast Extra. We are doing a podcast about the film When the Bow Breaks. It's a new psychological thriller film directed by John Cassar and written by Jack Olson. The film stars Morris Chestnut, Regina Hall, Theo Rossi, and Jazz Sinclair. The film is now available on DVD, and as a matter of fact, we did a giveaway recently over on BlackGirlNerds.com and had copies given away to our readers. In this interview features actors Regina Hall and Theo Rossi. This episode is hosted by Karan, and she interviews each of our guests in this BGM podcast extra. So sit back, relax, and stay tuned to a When the Bow Breaks episode of the BGM podcast. Enjoy. Hey guys, thanks for joining us for the Black Girl Nerds podcast. This is your girl, Karan. And today we have a very special guest. We know her from screens big and small. For years, Regina Hall has become our crack me up go-to girl, our BFF of film. In one of her latest films, When the Bow Breaks, will debut on digital December 13th and on Blu-ray and DVD December 27th. Regina, welcome to the Black Girl Nerds podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, I want to jump right into it. You really are a Black Girl Nerds. I learned that you have a master's degree in journalism. I do. Yeah, I do. I kind of love, I don't know why at that time it was a little bit different, but I always loved, uh, this is way before, um, I guess you could get your information online. Mm-hmm. So I always loved, um, when I was young, news programs like 60 Minutes and, you know, news Night, ABC News Nightline. And I would just watch them for whatever reason. I just thought, um, I thought the power of journalism was so powerful. You know what I mean? I thought it was a... Um, a very powerful thing to do to disseminate information, you know, in kind of a democracy where, yeah. you know, people got to, you know, read with discernment and understand. I don't know. So anyway, it was always interesting to me. And yeah. Very, very cool. You know, in, in the times that we're living in, we spoke just briefly. Um, it's a very scary time. And, and people do miss that journalism is actually a function of democracy 
and all of this mess that's going on with the media, but your life is, seems to be amazing. Um, when the bow breaks tells a disturbing tale of a family's turbulent road to becoming parents. And I'd like to know what you learned uh, during the filming and the research for this film. You know, I actually did learn a lot about um, fertility, infertility, what people go through, the treatment, um, you know, what a what it is, to, an inf- uh, embryo, what it is to have a mission, everything that Laura went through mm-hmm. prior to what we even see on the screen. I actually just went and did some research, and, and um, it happens. There are a lot more women as women um, – pursue careers now there are a lot more women deciding to have children later there are a lot of women who are deciding to um to take a non-traditional right route to not to not stop their um career and sometimes to have surrogates you know for reasons that aren't even health mm-hmm. so it's very interesting to just kind of see also what it takes what it does to the body hormonally everything um for a woman, you know, and 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 and, and a man, you know, because it, it 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 has its it it has its entire effect on a couple and on an entire family. Absolutely, one of the things that kind of struck my heart in the film, and I re- I remember this moment when Laura says she's not a woman, she's not a woman, and because she can't bear a child of her own, and so many women can connect to that feeling that they. Um, are not whole women or they are not enough of a woman because they can't bear their own children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I think there's, you know, there's that, I think we've been taught that. And I certainly don't believe that. I think a woman um, offers so much more uh, to the world than, than exclusively her fertility. Mm -hmm. And, and, but that feeling um, of when that possibility doesn't exist um is it's very um because we're taught that it's very daunting it is it is part you know i would i would equate it to a man who can't provide for his family Mm -hmm. you know who feels that um when when he can't um have provision Mm -hmm. you know for family he feels like less than a man and i think the woman that feels like she can't give the man a family she feels like less and obviously you know uh um like I said, you know, it's a it's a very, you know, it's a very true feeling, and 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 I really, you know, like I think women are so amazing for so many reasons, but I do I can understand how that, you know, would begin to wait on your on your soul and on your spirit. Yeah, and and it, we don't often talk about surrogacy as a viable option uh, towards ex- growing our families. Uh, we we talk a lot about adoption. We hear a lot about adoption, but it's not as much about surrogacy in, uh, in our community. Now, in, in this particular situation, I wanted to say, girl, don't let that girl in your house. You don't let no younger girl in your house. I but you know what? Say- I was telling the, the guy here before that one of the interviews before I said, you know, I think Laura was not, I think, you know, she was invited to the guest house, Mm -hmm. you know, wasn't the house, the primary residence. But at that point, you know, she was, she had been impregnated with their very last embryo. Yeah. And I think when they saw her come in and she had been beaten up, I mean, if she miscarried that baby, that was it for them. Yeah. That would be their last chance to have a a child that had their DNA imprint. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, I don't, I think they had probably been through some, I mean, she, they'd been married for years. I don't, I don't think she was threatened by another pretty girl. You know what I mean? I think she was like, okay, you know, and And whatever insecurity she had, they were usurped by her chance at motherhood and needing this, you know, I don't even think it was about, um, uh, the, 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 the surrogate at that point. I really think it was, it was completely like, I want my baby to stay mm-hmm. here. I need mm-hmm. to keep an eye on my child. And whether she was in that body or, you know, well, I don't know. I was about to say Beyonce's body. She Beyonce came here. I was, <laughs> I'd have had to bought Beyonce a house. And I'm like, you stay here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go live with her. And then when she has a baby, I'll come We're back. Gonna, yeah, we'll um, come back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you say here. 
Um, but yeah, no, I think that um you know, I really think that her 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 primary concern was 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 the health and the life of, of the baby. And I think a lot of times we get that maternal instinct wrong um, in that it only affects uh, us with our own children. I think that maternal instinct uh, kicked in for the protection of the girl too. When she, when they saw her beat up, she not only wanted to protect the baby, but also protect that young woman as well. I think so too. I, I, I do believe that. And I think, you know, it, it was for who they were as people. I think it was instinctive for them to say, well, you know, they didn't want him to come back. You also know how um, fragile someone is, you know, when they've been in a long-term relationship and, you know, what would, you know, if it, if she would be lonely, would, mm-hmm. it, would she want to go back? I think it was just trying to keep everything, you know, happy for her and safe for her. And, you know, so that she, she after she had this baby, would have, you know, enough esteem and finances to really go and forge her own, you know, her own path that would be great. I think they saw that she was a very kind young woman, you know, especially that conversation that she had with her in the house. Um, And she, you know, said, I've never had anything that anybody's ever wanted before. And I I think, um, you know, that was, that, you know. That was a powerful statement. With that. Hmm? That was a powerful statement when she said I never had anything that anybody wanted before. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of sad, but you know, still. And that's another reason I don't think, um, you know, I don't think, and, and what I did like about it, I liked her. I liked showing two black women um, and one wasn't insecure about the other, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. because of, uh, because she was pretty that she could, you know, be open to her and not be threatened or um, in competition with her, that she could just be open to another young woman who was coming up, who she wanted to, you know, be happy and, you know, do well in her journey. I think, you know, a lot of times they, we don't have a lot of images that show us, you know, being supportive. And I think we really are supportive. Um um, of one another, and I, I liked that that opportunity was there, even in that kind of rare circumstance. Absolutely. Now, when did you decide that you were going to go for this acting thing? When did you decide that you were going to make a change? And how did you make that? How did you come to that decision to go for it? Um. Well, you know, I I had a, a friend who had said, oh, you could make some extra money doing commercials. I think I was in, um, I had just finished college. And mm-hmm. I was like, okay. Uh, and I don't know, I was kind of auditioning, but it was, you know, uh, I, I don't think I had gotten anything. I, I don't, and then my pa- my mom and dad were like, if you don't go back to school, we're not paying for you to just be in New York. <laughs> and I was like, all right, I'm going to go back to school. So what happened was my very first semester, you know, my, my dad had a stroke mm. and he died and it was quite suddenly. And, and it just, um, you know, I was only, you know, 20, 23. Uh, and I think it just, uh, I just, he wasn't sick. It it just redirected. I don't, it, I mean, it just changed everything. That's, I mean, that's pro- probably the, the only thing I can say, and uh, I just really thought about the brevity of life, and I thought, well, what would I want to do? What would I want to try? And of course, I knew my father would want me to finish school, so I finished school because um, I actually enjoy school. I, I like it. I, you know, I was like, I could stay in. School. My family used to be like, Regina, are you gonna ever get a job? <laughs> I was like, Yeah, my job is going to school. Going to school. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> like I'm a professional student, <laughs> um, but. I did, um, I enjoyed acting as well. And so I just thought, you know, I'm going to try it. I really think my dad has been like a, an angel up there to, for a lot of things that have happened. And, you know, I I always say, I always, I don't talk about him, Mm -hmm. obviously, you know, because he's, he's not here, but, um, I did an interview where someone said, how was it growing up with, you know, a single mom? And I was like, oh my goodness, I felt 
horrible because my dad was such, my parents were divorced, but my dad was such a present and active father. Mm -hmm. And I kind of knew that there was this assumption, especially since I was a black girl, that he just wasn't around. Mm -hmm. Um, And he was, and he was an amazing father. He just had a, um, you know, um, an early passing. And so I don't speak of him enough. And I think in a lot of interviews, I always say I'm going home to see my mother and you know, that just came from him having been passed away so long. Um, but that, I think that kind of is what started a completely different train of thought about my life. That is so powerful. And what's even more powerful is just being able to watch you grow as an artist and as an actress and as just an overall entertainer, because I was so proud of you for the celebration of the Obamas hosting that. That was amazing. That was really, really nice. And it was, you know, I have to tell you, thank you so much. I uh, I have, uh, I feel like energetically, um, obviously my daddy's there, mm-hmm. but I feel like, um, and my grandmommy, but I feel like, oh, I got some uncles up there too. But I do <laughs> feel like in the world, I have such amazing um people who send me such good energy and um and genuine like you I mean like real genuine love and like I actually feel that and um it it so when things like um the Obama celebration happen it's it's like such a uh it feels like such a blessing you know first of all to just you know be able to to be able to celebrate their eight years but yes. You know, a lot of things just for my my mom who's still alive to be able to see and for um, um, young girls, you know what I mean? Like I had, as a, I had a, a mentor who's like my aunt now who just always, always was just, she used to write, well, she still writes, but she wrote these amazing articles that would be all around NYU and I would see them and I would they were so inspiring to life's potential Mm -hmm. and you don't know what that is for you. You know what I mean? You're kind of in the process and the journey of life. And then five years, it may be something else, but it's always a, it's always forward, you know? And every time I saw her do something, I'd be like, that's incredible. And I just feel like that kind of trickles, um, not even down, but around, you Mm -hmm. know, like it spreads like, I was about to say semen, and that is not what I meant. I think I meant <laughs> power. <laughs> I was like, that doesn't. In, in my brain, I was like, that doesn't seem right. But I think I meant power. Um, and it's and you know it's it's wonderful. So yeah, it's been great, and I've just had so many people who I've been able to grow just from watching and being around. So thank you. That that was, and it was a fun night to see the Obama smiling. Oh my gosh, they were getting it in. And happy. It was, and I didn't even see it, but at least I was there because I was in South Carolina and they didn't have BET. Well, let me tell you, you look good, like, girl. You look BET good, girl. It was so good and you looked amazing. Thank you. That was my little wig. You see my little wig? Girl, it I was working for you. Now. It was working, girl. I've gotten it. I used to have the weaves. And I loved my weaves, but then my edges were like, you got about six more months of this and then we're leaving. <laughs> you know, we got we got we got to do better this. getting the girls together with the wigs because, you know, if I see one more lace front unlaced, I'm going to have a fit. I know, you got to really, be, you know what, it's all in the application. Mm-hmm. I have really like, because I'm like, I just, I look, I mean, I study. I'm like, well, what are the ones that work? It's all in the application. Yes, and some I, good I told color. Two girls, actually, on the job I just did, I said, "Now we're gonna listen. I'm gonna tell you how to get these right." <laughs> and they were like, "Cause I was like, we we this is how we have to have to support one another as well. That's right. You know, so our best foot forward. So I was like, we're gonna cut this. We're gonna pluck a few and make that a little wider in the part. Mm-hmm. And we're gonna make sure there and, is a part you know, and it's not and they, sitting three feet off your head. Yeah. Amen. Somebody yes. say amen. It's a, it's a wig, not a hat. <laughs> not a head covering but they looked great by the time they left well you look great I want to thank you first of all for holding up the Black Don't Crack crew because um, girl <laughs> preservation is a gift thank you <laughs> you're beautiful and I always ask if there's a word that you'd like to offer to our Black Girl Nerds audience um, we have a lot of young women who also follow this podcast and 
Um, it's so important. You, you've given some us some jewels in this interview, and I know we got to cut it short. And I'm gonna miss you, girl. But I like to. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to ask you if there's something that you'd like to just plant into their hearts before you go. Oh gosh, there's so much. You know, I would just say. You know, uh, like for me, honestly, having, you know, my connection to God, and I, it seems so cliche, but the seed that starts there sprouts so much in your life. And, you know, I I really want young black women to know how special they are yes. in relationship to everything, like to never be less than for a job, a man, a relationship, anything that to recognize that you are a crown jewel. And every time that you do something amazing, you literally wash a little bit, you know, like diamonds are buried, you're mm-hmm. cleaning off that jewel so your shine can show. Like you are, and it doesn't, we don't have to be um, famous. We just have to be true to who we are, and then we are, we we dazzle as bright as any other thing in this entire world. So I just want them to walk into the world feeling 100% amazing, amazing, not even good, but amazing. Even on the days that they don't feel amazing, you can still know you're amazing. You are amazing, and it's not, it's, it's, comes from an intrinsic quality in your very being that you are amazing. So you don't even have to do anything but be true to who you are. Regina, Regina, Regina. From one black girl nerd and news geek to another, thank you. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. I love that you have this. Thank you. You have to come and do a, 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 um, a day on your show. We would uh, love to yeah. have you. We would love to have you back anytime. Please tell our audience where they can find you online. Oh yeah, I'm at um, uh, uh, I'm at More Regina Hall, and I think that's the name of it on everything. Okay, More Regina Hall, but I'm not on Snapchat yet. I'm still trying to work with Snapchat. We're gonna get there one day. I don't know how to snap. I and barely the, know how to do anything else. But in, I'm in the on great there. by and by, we're gonna get there one day. Um, before I let you go. <laughs> Hey guys, this is Karan with the Black Girl Nerds podcast. And although we are a bunch of black girl nerds, we still give good love to bad boys. Theo Rossi is no exception. Known for his roles in Son of Anarchy with the Juice and for being the epitome of shade in Luke Cage, he is quickly becoming the master of manipulation and mixed intent. While we know bad boys do bad things, and when the bow breaks, he takes us even darker in this psychological thriller, soon to be released in digital, Blu-ray, and DVD. Theo, welcome to the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan, as I was just saying, so uh, very cool to be here. You just you just made 100,000 women swoon, just so you know. Um <laughs> Because we did follow you in Luke Cage, we totally li- we uh, live tweeted Luke Cage, and we so we enjoyed every part of the show. What was it like to make uh, Alfred Woodard swoon? <laughs> oh man, I gotta tell you, I mean, when you talk about like truly, you know, the word gets thrown around so much as like you know, legend and like you know, just a, a, a just a queen in every aspect, but just. I mean, just a wonderful, incredible human being. And, you know, that's all we want in this world, right? We just want to be around and hang around and and work with, you know, people who we truly just enjoy being around. And she's just, she's just something else. So what we got to do and, and, you know, and continue to do is, uh, it's fun, man. And and we're just getting started with, with that whole thing. We're just getting started with that. Well, it's amazing to watch you grow as an actor and an artist, but how did you get so good at being so bad? <laughs> you know, somebody asked me yesterday, somebody said, you know, you should try playing a, a good guy once in a while. I said, you know, what's funny is I, I wouldn't mind doing that. I'm actually like the polar opposite of the things I play, but it's just kind of what I do. You know, some people just play cops and FBI guys, and some people play 
I guess, you know, like really good comedic things. And for, for me, I guess I'm just like this manipulating <laughs> psychopath all the time. <laughs> how about <laughs> that? kind of, how about that? I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why. I guess it's, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe it's because nobody, I'm, I'm mysterious to people. I'm not, I'm not out and about like most people. I don't know. Well, we like some mystery, and I think you have uh, captured the title in my heart as the king of the side eye. You have such a, you have such a peaceful <laughs> resting face that can turn at a micro with a microaggression, a micro <laughs> muscle movement, and you can turn in a second, and then you smile, and it's like everything that's, around that's, you that's disarms. In, in New York. <laughs> some people might call that some people might call that bipolar of some type, but <laughs> you know I. You know what it is? I think it's like, I try to, my, my biggest thing that I try to do, you know what I mean? And, and is I just try to play no matter how bad someone is, I have to find something likable yeah. about them. And I have to, I have to make the greatest thing for me is when people feel something like I want you to hate me or love me, but I want you to feel something. I don't want you to feel like nothing. I don't want you to ever come up to me and be like, oh, yeah, you were pretty good in that. Or, oh, that was cool. You were good. I want it to be like, I hate you. You were the worst human being in the world. Or I want it to be like, I loved you. I couldn't wait for you to come back on and do this. Because I just want you to feel something. Because the whole point of this all is like, you know, to make people feel some kind of emotion. So what I love about social media is you get to really see people's reactions in real time. And as your brilliant thing is called, you know, black girl nerds, like I'm a nerd at heart. You know, I'm one of these weird, like, you know, kind of like uh, hybrids in a way. Like I played sports my whole life. I was mm -hmm. kind of, you know, li living like a, a, a kind of, you know, nefarious lifestyle growing up in New York City. But at the same time, I was the dude who was reading comics every day. I was in art school drawing. I was like, you know, so I, and I'm, I'm, the, I'm that guy. I haven't seen a movie in the theater since... Star Wars, and I'm going to be first online to see Star Wars when it comes out again. <laughs> like that's in the new one this this weekend. So it's like I'm, I still have that whole love for this. So for me to be able to do this, what I'm doing, I mean, especially with Marvel and things like Sons of Anarchy and all this other stuff, it's like I'm like a little kid in Playland right now. This is this is a dream. That's amazing. Now. You mentioned that you want us to feel something, and when the bow breaks, I felt a whole lot of things. And one of them was <laughs> not love from Mike Mitchell. What was the deal with that dude, man? What was it like playing Mike? You know, he was he was a really tough one for me because it was really short notice. I didn't have a lot of time, mm -hmm. and he was. It was. I always say. I said it earlier in our conversation that I have to find something good and likable about a character. Mm -hmm. And I had a really hard time finding something you good had to and likable about. One. Yeah, I, I had a reach, and you know what I found was, you know, the things that you know aren't necessarily highlighted is that he was in the military. So you know, there was something in him that wanted to, you know, go serve his country. He, you know, he wanted a better life. You know, so I had to find that, and even though that's really hard to see because he's such a, you know, he's doing such awful things. It's like if I if I think the guy is completely terrible, then I can't play him. And to to do that in a movie like that, that movie, the reason I love that movie, and I and I, I don't care, you know, I love thrillers. I have so much fun with them. I think that they were missing them. I don't think we do them, you know. I don't think there's enough of them that take you on that thrill ride of like, there's no CGI, there's no big whooping stunts. It's just a thriller that you just don't know what's going to happen. And sometimes they're done really right. And sometimes they're done really wrong, but I just always wanted to do stuff like that. And I love, because there are some crazy people out there. <laughs> there yeah. are crazy people. And what people don't realize is that movie was based on the true story. Really? Which is crazy. Yes. It's crazy. I found that out at the premiere in LA when I was there. The writer was like, oh, yeah, this was like a true story, like like almost. And, and then he said something that I thought was even crazier. He said, the true story might even been crazier than the movie. I was like, what? Wow. <laughs> you know, and I didn't know this. I didn't know this when I was filming it. But then you look at the news today, you look at the stuff we read, and you go, oh, I believe that. Yeah. But there's crazy things that go on. So 
this guy was just, you know, he, he's that awful human being. And from, from when you're talking to a guy right now who was raised by women, you know, my nana, my mother, my, my older sister. So I was, you know, I'm surrounded by women my whole life. Mm-hmm. And this guy, to play a guy like who, who's as, you know, despicable like that, um, I had to reach. And, you know, uh, he, he was a tough one, but, you know, you hated him. And that's, that's, that's kind of the point. I did. And I'm a vet. So I was kind of, you know, I got real salty when he lied about going back on tour, going back to tour. I was, Mm -hmm. I was like, Oh, he is so lying right now. But um, tell us for those who don't know who Mike is, how is he positioned into this psychological thriller? Because this is really great storytelling. You know, it's, it's one of those things where you get this young girl and and she's just being influenced by her fiance, you know, and, and in a lot of relationships, you know, somebody has the upper hand, somebody kind of dominates and she is, you know, she has the, you know, she's going to be a surrogate for this couple that has their last viable embryo that really is, you know, really is excited and really wants to have a kid. And Regina and Morris are just like the greatest ever. And you've got this young actress, Jazz Sinclair, who's, you know, just about she to uh, awesome. take off, take yeah, she's going to just be everywhere and take off and just a beautiful human being in, in every aspect. And, you know, you got you got just really great actors in the film. You got Michael K. Williams coming in. You know, you got Rami Malek. You got, you got all these people coming in. And you have this story of them trying, like really at the base of it, it's just these people who just want to have a baby. And, and everything just goes awry because, you know, in a lot of these different things that, People want a kid, you know, from, from adoption to surrogates, you know, whatever. Things, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. And this movie just makes a really huge, you know, uh, uh, big, like, over-the-top mm-hmm. example of something that can and takes the audience on this crazy ride. And, you know, it's one of those movies that you just got to go in and you just got to have fun. And if you're sitting there like you know, analyzing it like it's Casablanca, you're going to have a problem. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just to go and have fun and eat some popcorn and, and, and do your thing. And I think that that's always been my favorite way to go to movies and just kind of escape and get into a story and, and kind of whatever. So it was a, a ton of fun. I'm really excited for people to start seeing it now, especially with the way we watch we watch everything. Is uh, More people are doing iTunes and digital downloads and everything. So it'll have this whole nother life coming up and we're ready for that. Yeah, and you know, um, I know Jazz is the newcomer, but you have had quite the run with some old and some <clears throat> soon-to-be legends. And I had a chance to talk to Regina the other day, Regina Hall, mm-hmm. and I am so in love with I that love girl. Her. She is just a doll. She's one. She's one of my favorite humans in the business, and I say that because there are certain people that the second you meet them, and I've been really lucky. I've been at this for sixteen years, mm-hmm. so I've, I've I've met. I've met and worked with, you know, some, a lot of people and Hollywood, Hollywood's a tricky place. You know what I mean? Um, it's a, it's a tough because a lot of people are, you know, caught up in their own world or, or, you know, can't get out the inside of their shirt sometimes, you know, they just can't see anything. And when you get around someone who people don't realize how long Regina's been doing this at a high level, yeah. she's been in everything. She jumps from comedy to drama like it's nothing. She's as funny as they come um, and just an incredible person. So I was so excited to work with her and we had a blast on set. Um, so, uh, yeah, she's 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 great. And she's so good at the film. And she she is. She's so she is just so genuinely warm and funny. And mm-hmm. and then you have, you know, Chocolate Dream or Chestnut. Uh, <laughs> who everybody loves, who's like batting a hundred right now everybody. as well. Everybody's doing so great, but Jazz, as a newcomer, what was it like working with her? Because she is really young, but she is so talented. Her character Anna uh, was really like three or four people. Yeah, you know, I mean, when you get a newcomer and you put them in that situation, you know, they're either going to sink or swim, and they're either going to get kind of caught up in the whole thing. And I've been lucky. I did two films in a row right after the sun's ended right before Luke Cage back mm-hmm. to back. And, you know, uh, the, the newcomer was, you know, jazz in this film. And then, and then in my next film coming out, Lowriders, we, this little, you know, Gabe Shavaria, who's, you know, on that show, East Los, 
he's another newcomer that kind of they brought up. And when they do that, when you see what I was so, what makes me so happy for the future of this business and these young kids is that I'm really lucky because I get these kids who just want to come in and work, you know, and they see it as work and they just want to come in and do it. And Jazz was like that, you know, Jazz just was like back to her room working, doing her thing. And she was just like, I got to work. I got to do this. I got to come up with this character. And she knew, you know, it's almost like the, the Eminem song. It's like you got one shot, you know, and yeah. she knew like this was a shot and she was going to put in her time and really do it. So for me, it was like, I got to come in and just have so much fun because she was just there and ready and willing to kind of take it to do, you know, because we had to do some really, really dark stuff together. And that, that could, that could shake a person to its core if they're not kind of ready for that. And she was just ready. Well, Theo, I know you got to go. I wish I could spend more time with you, but I'm going to give you the floor um, just to give a word to our Black Girl Nerds audience, we do love you. We support you. We're glad to see you. And thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much. And, you know, uh, as I said, I've been following you guys, you know, mainly when Luke Cage hit. And, uh, you know, I think we really kind of adjusted the culture a little uh, and the TV landscape and just showed people, you know, a lot of things that, you know, we were really excited to show them. Um, and with, you know, with the films and with everything, you know, I'm just so, I'm one of those people that, you know, I'm always so incredibly uh, impressed with the support of, uh, you know, of of the community, of everybody and, and the fans that, you know, I've been able to acquire over the years and, and just know that I appreciate it extremely. And uh, I'm one of those people that always says, you know, everybody sits there and, and thanks to all these other people, but without the fans, without the people who write about it, without the people who pay to, you know, whether it be for Netflix or movie tickets, none of this exists. So I just want to say thank you so much. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and Shady Mariah will write again soon. And it's, uh, <laughs> and it's, um, it's, it's all good. And, and, uh, and thanks for having me, like I said. Thanks for tuning in to this BGM Podcast Extra, and we will see you in the new year with brand new episodes of our regularly scheduled Black Girl Nerds Podcast. Happy holidays. That was a HeadGum Podcast.